Welcome back everyone, Racer X here, and today's video is one I've been waiting to put out for quite a while. I've actually been waiting on Stellantis to respond to my questions about the Demon 170. Now they do give a Demon 170 owner's supplement manual, if you will. This is basically a factory built drag car. It is the quickest production car in the world, zero to 60. It does a lot of really neat things, but it does uh, some things differently than a standard Hellcat Red Eye. So they gave us a Demon 170 supplement, which in my mind, was pretty darn vague. So I asked a lot of questions that the uh, 170 supplement doesn't necessarily point out. And today they finally got back to me with some of the answers to the questions that I asked. So today we will talk about what their responses were. If you guys are brand new to my channel, don't forget, hit subscribe. You can find that button right over here. Also, don't forget to hit that notification bell so you're notified as to when my new content comes out. And off we go. Guys, check it out. I am back at the Dream Giveaway Garage, and directly behind me is one of their newest giveaways. They've just announced it. It is their Challenger Giveaway with old school and new school muscle. You can see that is a 2023 Challenger Superstock, and that is a 1970 Challenger RT. Both of these beautiful Plum Crazy Challengers are being given away in the same drawing. Let's take a closer look. This 1970 446 pack Challenger RT is absolutely stunning. This thing is mint condition. Just look at the condition of this old school beast. I'm gonna show you the inside of it really quick as well. Formerly owned by the president of Chrysler, truly has an old school feel on the inside, but an absolutely epic car. And to be paired with one of my favorite Hellcat trims, probably my favorite Hellcat trim, the Superstock. If you are a drag racer, you know all about this. And since I filmed the last promo for you guys, they've added some things to this car to make it really unique. As we know, uh, it comes with kind of the drag race inspired suspension on it. You can see right there, it is in fact a Hellcat Red Eye 807 horsepower. But take a look at all the carbon fiber they have added from Anderson Composites. I just want to show you some of the detail that they've added to this beautiful uh, super stock. Check it out right up here. They've got this going on right here. You can see the lights here in the front of it. You've got the splitter right here in the front. And as we step around to the rear of the car, you have an awesome carbon fiber spoiler right here. And then also down here, you've got a diffuser also made in carbon fiber. A lot of little custom touches they just added to this super stock. You can see the cat right here on the side. They added a couple things on the inside as well. I love this purple lighting that they've added all over this car. You can see right here on the door, and then of course uh, right here on the door sill as well. Last call, lots of little custom touches. They just added this stuff to this super stock to make it even more appealing. And as I mentioned, both of these cars come in the same drawing. I realize this is a brand new drawing, but if you guys have not already entered, definitely go to Dream Giveaway's website and enter to win. Use my code RACERX and you get not two, but three times the entries for one price. I will pin a link down in the comment section below so it's really easy to find. I would absolutely love to see one of my subscribers win both of these two beautiful cars. And as I mentioned to you guys in the past, if one of my subscribers happens to win, I will do a dedicated video with both of your brand new beautiful challengers. I cannot wait to see who wins. Many of you that follow my channel closely are probably well aware this is not my original engine that was in the car. Unfortunately, I had to have my engine replaced at 2,000 miles, um, about what, 12, 13 passes on the car, not very many, and uh, we got a brand new engine. So kudos to Stellantis, they sent me a brand new one and I'm currently in the process of breaking in this brand new engine, meticulously, I might add. So I'm out putting a few more break-in miles on the car, kind of running through the RPM band, all the kind of stuff that I did before. And I was really kind of curious, I asked Stellantis some really tough questions because I didn't want what happened to me to happen to other people. Certainly, if I can help it, maybe spread a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of awareness. Um, if I did something goofy, I really wanna know what it is. And they've already responded to me saying, listen, it wasn't an issue with you breaking in the car or how you broke in the car, anything like that. That was not the cause of it. But I had a lot of other questions based on, you know, just things people have sent me. Some of the quality control engineers reached out to me saying, hey, look, no, you should do X, Y, Z. Well, I have seven different questions that I asked them that they just responded to. And um, I'm going to go ahead and park the car. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what those questions were and what their responses were. 
So right here is the printed off copy of the questions that I sent off to Stellantis, which they answered just today. There are seven different questions, so I'm just gonna kind of read them off in order and kind of give you my thoughts on the answers. The first one, should the engine be broken in exclusively on 93 octane fuel. This is something that several of the quality control engineers that worked on the Demon 170 project actually kind of told me about, hey, run your car on 93 when you're breaking it in, um, the different steps to break the car in the right way, which I basically already knew. But when I broke in the original engine on this car, I did use a mix of 93 and uh, E85. So obviously the horsepower would go up and down a little bit because of the inline flex fuel sensor. But I was told, look, definitely on this second engine break it in on 93 octane it's just better for the engine Stellantis's response was uh, there's no need to break in exclusively with only 93 octane fuel or E85 uh, the only direction is that the car should not be stored long term with E85 as mentioned in the Demon 170 addendum so right here Stellantis is saying no you can break it in on 93 or E85 or basically a mixture there in between um, it's not necessary to do do that. That surprised me just a little bit. Now, this next question has sparked all sorts of banter all across the internet. I've seen it on the forums. I've seen it everywhere. And everybody seems to have a varying opinion on this. The question is, at what point should you perform your first oil change? And their answer, the recommended oil change interval is 3,000 miles, more frequently if the vehicle is being used for track slash race purposes. They don't explain what more frequently means. They are purposely vague on this. So it's kind of just left up to your own interpretation as to what more frequently means. We'll get into that a little bit more with uh, one of the other questions. It says, after break-in, if the vehicle is used for track slash race purposes, before the first 3,000 mile interval, an oil change is recommended. So in their mind, I think they're thinking like 1,500 because that is what <clears throat> the Demon 170 supplement actually mentions. Yet you can have all of your drag race features at 500. They're all unlocked. And truth be told, I have talked to many people about this. They really put the 1500 mile break-in thing in the 170 for the people that don't really understand how to break an engine in. I have talked to multiple engineers about this and truth be told, it's not so much about the mileage. And Dodge, like I said, Dodge knew exactly what I was doing with this car. And um, they were perfectly fine with me drag racing and doing all of the things that I was doing with the car. But I put a lot of heat cycles in the car, had a lot of varying RPM. I did a lot of things with this car to get it ready to go. And they were very, very confident in my ability to just go out and do whatever I needed to do in this car. But I don't like that they were super vague about when you're actually supposed to do your oil change. Are you supposed to break it in and then you know, 500 miles later, you go ahead and change the oil. And then again, at 1500 and then again, 3000, some people say that that's really good insurance to do it that way. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree, but is it overkill? Um, and they're basically saying right here, if you're not racing it, you can get to 3000 miles on the original break in oil without a problem. Now, the third question is about the oil. And there have been lots of people speculating that this car may actually have a bit of an oil starvation issue when it's launching hard at the track because of the way the car is designed, the way the oil pickup is designed on the car. So I asked, is OW40 really the ideal viscosity for this engine with the car being able to pull two lateral Gs on the skid pad? And the answer was simply, yes. Um, a lot of people feel like maybe that oil is a little bit too thin. Um, we don't know if there's actually a true issue with the oiling system on this car, being that it does launch so hard. I know there have been a lot of Hellcats that have gotten deep into the eights, some of them even into the sevens, and they didn't change the oil system in the car. So that is a bit of an enigma to me, but we know the Demon 170 it is a little bit of a different animal. But as far as Dodge and Stellantis is concerned, OW40, uh, the exact same engine oil that you would put in an SRT vehicle, um, whether it's a 6.4 liter, uh, whether it is a regular Hellcat variant, a Red Eye, or the Demon 170, they feel like that is the right oil viscosity to put in the vehicle. Now, this next question had a little bit of a weird answer to me. So the question is, how often should you change your oil if you are running E85 fuel? Should it be more often than if you run premium fuel. Essentially, if you're running E85, should you change your oil more often than if you're running 93 octane? That's what I was trying to ask. And their answer was, under normal driving conditions, there is no need to change the oil more often, even with E85, as mentioned in the addendum. 
if used for track slash race purposes, the vehicle should be monitored for the level and quality of the oil and the oil should be changed more often. That is a weird statement to me. Um, I think the general consensus is that you should always change your oil more often on E85 because ethanol has a tendency to kind of get into the oil a little bit. We know that that dilutes the oil, which can limit the effectiveness and how it lubricates the engine, which could cause the engine to have problems. Uh, right here, they're saying under normal driving conditions, you don't need to change it any more often. I thought that was a little bit weird. And I know that this vehicle was made to be flex fuel, but they're saying you can do 3,000 miles if you're just driving the car around like normal. Although if you have a 170, I hope you're not driving it around like Miss Daisy. Um, that would be a bit of a bummer. That's not what this car was made to do. You're speeding, I can see it. No, Miss Daisy, no. We're only doing about 19 miles an hour. I like to go under the speed limit. Yes, but the speed limit's 35, yeah. The slower you go, the more you save on gas. But the other thing that's weird, it should be monitored for the level, which we should all do. We should always check our engine oil to see if the engine is eating any oil to make sure that it's got enough oil. You don't want to overfill it either. That's a whole nother set of problems. But it also says the quality of the oil, which to me means you have to take some of the oil out to look at it and possibly even send it off to a company like Blackstone to have it tested how often are you really supposed to do that? They don't say any of that in here. This is very, very vague information. And, you know, how do you necessarily test the quality of the oil yourself? It's pretty darn hard to do. Yes, you can look at it. You can give it the eyeball test. You can see if there's glitter in it, which, you know, is really, really bad, which is what happened to my first engine. But the only way to test it is to order a bunch of Blackstone lab kits or, you know, there are other companies that do that and to constantly be pulling the oil out of it and testing it. I feel like that is a really weird answer and it's asking an awful lot of somebody on a factory production car. I had to go ahead and start the car and move it a little bit. I didn't want the car to sit and idle too long. It's just too hot to sit in here without the car on. Only a couple questions left to go through. This next one is another one. There were all sorts of people debating all across the internet on this one. Do you need to change your oil every time you track the car? Some nights you only get one or two passes, so is that really necessary? And like I said, people are all across the board on this. My personal opinion is the 20 pass rule and I've operated a lot of E85 cars and I kind of always had a log of how many runs I would get on a given night because yeah you don't want to have to go to the track and only get one or two passes and then have to go home and put $200 worth of oil in the car every time that that happens um, but you also don't want to go too long on the same oil so I've kind of always had the 20 pass rule and you get a pretty good gauge in your head when you have about 20 passes in the car and of course you do have your 3,000 mile recommendation there as well if you're not really tracking the car but what they stated, there is no requirement to change the oil with every track slash race outing. But it is recommended to monitor the level and the quality of the oil at the start and the end of the track slash race day. As mentioned in the addendum, if used for track slash race purposes, the vehicle should be monitored for the level and quality of the oil and the oil should be changed more often. So once again, a very kind of weird, vague answer from these guys because they don't say, once again, how often. They don't say how many passes you're supposed to get. They, they purposely leave it really vague. And once again, they talk about um, how you should be checking the quality of the oil. Yes, before you race, you should always see how much oil is in your car. After you're done, why not? It only takes a second to check the oil level. But the oil quality, which they're saying you should check before and after you race, that's much harder to do because you have to take physically take oil out and analyze it. Really, the only way to analyze uh, the oil effectively is to send it off, once again, to a lab and have them look at it. Are you really going to do that before you race every time, right? Um, so you're going to send it off, wait for the results, then go race, then get home, take the oil out, send it off and make sure it's okay. Are you wanting to do that? How often are you wanting to do that? And that's what they're recommending to me um, right here. I mean, you have to check the level and the quality and that's what is so weird to me. So once again, very vague and, and that, that response doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Now, the next question is another one that I got an awful lot, especially like in the 170 community. On the forums, you see this question a lot. 
what is the proper gapping for the spark plugs on these cars? Because they came with champion spark plugs right out of the gate. I have talked to several of the quality control engineers and they said, look, they really did not put an ideal spark plug in this engine. The people that actually tested it had a lot more luck with the NKGs, but they couldn't get the NKGs they wanted to put in it. So they went with a less perfect plug, if you will, in the champions. And my understanding is that they gapped these plugs at like a 0.82 from the factory. And it says right here, the answer 0.6 is what they should be gapped at. And then when I talked to a bunch of the engineers, they said if you go with the NKGs, the ideal gap should actually be like 0.28 to 0.30. That is the ideal gap. So to me, a 0.6 gap seems really big and a 0.8 to 0.82 gap seems really big for a factory plug. Um, but right here, what they're recommending, 0.6. So I realize that's another one that's gonna create probably a lot more questions uh, rather than kind of solving the issue. I feel like a lot of people are gonna question 0.6. Maybe there is a difference with obviously going to a step colder plug, which is why you would gap them down a little bit. But right here, the recommendation from Stellantis on the factory plug is 0.6. And now for the last question, should I be using some sort of fuel additive when exclusively running E85? Many of you are well aware I have been running E85 cars for a long time. And E85 is absolutely fantastic. It burns cold, it burns clean, but you do burn through a lot of it. And the big drawback to E85 is there aren't really any lubricating properties in ethanol-based fuel, while 93 octane has quite a few things in it that actually lubricate the system. So what I've always done on cars that aren't flex fuel like this one is I would put a lubricating additive in the fuel to kind of keep everything lubed in there and keep everything happy. Um, with this car, you do have the added benefit of being able to just put 93 in it. Um, what they state here is no, using fuel additives is not recommended and is not how the engine was validated. All validation was completed on either straight E10 i.e. 93 octane or E85, also a mixture of kind of in between, if you will, which is why they have an inline flex fuel sensor telling how much ethanol is in the fuel and adjusting accordingly. But according to Stellantis, you do not need to add any sort of lubricating fuel additive if you're running E85 in the car. And they actually don't go on to say that you ever need to put 93 octane in it once you're running um, E85. Um, so I would think every so often you'd want to run 93 in it, but they don't say anything about it in the addendum or uh, do they say anything about it in the answers to the questions? So you should be able to just run E85 as much as you want, as often as you want, according to these guys. So there you have it. Those are all of the answers that I received from Stellantis. And if I'm being completely transparent, just open and honest, I'm kind of disappointed. I almost have more questions now than I had before. I'm not really understanding what it means when they say, check the oil quality. Yes, I understand the oil level. Um, that's easy to do. You got a dipstick right there. You check the oil level. Um, if it's not quite high enough, you can top it off. You also want to check for oil consumption. That's all stuff that good racers and people that take good care of their cars, they do it. And certainly you would want to do it before and after a track day. I get that but they're purposely vague on a lot of things. Um, when you should change your oil for the first time, how often you should change it. They don't tell you anything about passes. They purposely just say you should change it more often. Um, so they really just leave it up to you, uh, which I think is sort of odd. I was kind of hoping for a more finite answer. Hey, every 15 passes, we would like for you to change the oil. Um, if you've been doing a mixture of track and street, every 2,000 miles. Give, give me something a little bit more tangible to hold on to than uh, what the Demon 170 supplement says. I know what it says, and it is very vague, which is why I asked the questions in the first place, but I really got nothing back I think that's usable that I can pass on to everybody to say, hey, look, you know, either here's what's happened to my engine. Maybe I made a mistake, X, Y, Z. As far as I can tell, I did everything perfect to the T, they're not saying anything other than that to me, other than they believe I broke the engine in the right way. That's the feedback I've received. Um, so maybe at one point I'll actually understand what happened to my individual engine, but I have nothing really to say other than I'm just a little more perplexed about the answers and just how vague they were. Um, and it is a little bit of a bummer. So who knows, maybe I can kind of drill down with these guys a little bit more but it really sounds to me like they're telling everybody, we're gonna leave it up to you on how often you change the oil. Um, if you wanna put additive in it, fine, but you don't necessarily need it. Um, but 
I just, I just feel like they purposely did not say a whole lot. So anyway, guys, I will uh, let you guys kind of digest that a little bit. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below, and I'll catch you on the next one. So until then, Racer X.